This video is meant to be a first attempt in trying to introduce what I'm calling fullness Calvinism, and it is supposed to explain and find clear, simple, non-controversial answers to a number of the questions that Christianity has struggled to answer through the centuries, such as why did God choose some rather than all? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? Is there just one cosmos or many? And so forth. These will be completely fresh and new answers to these questions that what I call fullness Calvinism involves. And let's, this is, this is meant to be, this is meant to be a first draft of this theology. Whether or not it'll be the final draft, I don't know, but it's meant to be an initial video on a larger project that should continue for some time. It's based in the academic paper that I wrote called God's Pre-Election Knowledge of the Soul, which is listed in the Calvinism section on praiseandlove.net. Again, the primary point of this video is to really just get the, the basics of the theology out as simply as possible without taking a lot of time so the framework can be digested as a whole without a huge amount of time consumed. So here we go. First, I will scan a couple of the major ideas in the paper I've written called God's Pre-Election Knowledge of the Soul, New Interpretation of Biblical Election and Predestination, Showing Why God Only Chose Some. I completed it on August 15, 2018. There's a couple major points in that paper. Firstly, the idea that God has foreknowledge as described in Romans 8.29 and many other places in uh, Scripture involves the idea that the, the prefix for FRE has changed through time in an erroneous way as Old English transferred to Middle English and then Current English where initially foreknowledge meant knowledge from the beginning, whereas later foreknowledge turned into meaning knowledge of the future, sort of like clairvoyance. Putting that in simpler terms, foreknowledge the way I'm defining it, and way, the way I believe it was originally meant to be defined, is God focusing on the first moment, whereas the way it's used now, which I think is er erroneous and not what Romans 8.29 and other verses in the Bible are referring to in discussing pre God's predestination of reality is where foreknowledge is meant to refer to all moments after the very initial moment, perhaps including the, in the, the initial moment of a thing, but also all moments after. There's a very stark difference between the two and theology radically differs between the two. The definition of foreknowledge often includes both of these understandings and you can see it mixing through time as Old English transferred into the current usage of the word foreknowledge. I outline this all in section three in great detail to show how different Bible translations transferred through time and still sort of sway back and forth between the two definitions of foreknowledge. And I show evidence for the correct definition being the first one, knowledge of the earliest time rather than the incorrect interpretation of foreknowledge, which is knowledge of the future before it happens, knowing the future. Now again, strictly speaking, both of these are correct, but the point is, is that foreknowledge was meant to refer to the first definition in the theology of election and predestination, such as in Romans 8.29 and other places. I would say the evidence is quite substantial showing that foreknowledge was meant to refer to God's knowledge of an entity from its first moment, rather than referring to the knowledge God also has of all following moments. That would be something like post-knowledge or interior knowledge or something like that, not foreknowledge, which is knowledge from the beginning. As we see in John 6, 64, but there are some of you that believe not for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed and should betray him. It doesn't say that God knew from all moments after. Of course, he still did. But the verse says from the beginning, not from the moments after the beginning. So from the first instance, God created a soul 
he would have known who they are that are to be chosen and not chosen, who they are that will betray and not betray, what souls those are that have the specific quality and structure that will be such where he can put his spirit into. And before moving on, let's discuss one important aspect. This type of Calvinism involves an idea that I don't think is discussed much that I know of, which seems to be a very simple idea right out of scripture, but I don't know of anybody discussing it. And it's the idea that all human souls were created during the first week, during creation week, Genesis 1, and later implanted into, associated with, however you want to put it, human bodies in reality where they were meant to be. In other words, your soul was created during creation week, whenever that was in the past. And when you were conceived or at some specific time, when your body and yourself becomes a living soul, God associated your biology, your body with having your soul to make both of those you. And so there's a two-step process. The soul is created. It's housed somewhere. And then when appropriate, it is implanted into your life. Now, the evidence for that is in Genesis 126, where it's, we're told, where we're told that God created humans. And then we're told in Genesis 2 verse 7, God made Adam a living soul. Notice that word living there implies bio, biology indicating biological function. So if you take the two of those together, we it would seem we'd have to conclude that Adam's, Adam was created in the first week, and as any other soul was, and then when he was placed in his setting on earth, that soul was coupled with his body to make him a living soul, a biological creature, a biological soul. Now, there's scriptural evidence perhaps there, but I think the stronger evidence is when we consider original sin, which shows us the soundness of this concept of how human persons were created, what timing and so forth. Now, original sin we know has to be true, as I've already discussed, because if it's not, then there exists other sinless humans other than Jesus, which is not possible. So therefore, all human souls have to be in a state of sin, whether you want to call that potential sin or active sin or what is not my concern here, as it was not in the other article I wrote on this topic, but rather just the fact that humans are in a state of sin from the point of Adam's sin onward, no matter where they are, if they're in a in storage waiting to be made living souls with their biological body or or they already were such as Adam was now there's an important issue here if all souls weren't created at the outset during on the on the sixth day in cre during creation week that would mean that if souls are being still created say now for babies that are being born at this moment, for babies that are being conceived at this moment, or whenever a soul is needed to unite with its biological functioning, that would mean that God would have to be creating souls that are sinful. But God can't create souls that are sinful because God cannot create sin. So all souls would have had to have been created before Adam's original sin. That means all souls would have had to have been created on day six of creation week and then gone into a storage situation and therefore are waiting, for lack of better words, to be implanted in their biological machine, their biological automata. So there are souls now that are waiting to be implanted and associated with, for lack of better words, with their biological automata just as yours was before you were conceived. And this all leads to a very important 
central issue in fullness Calvinism, which is the issue that the creation of souls on day six happened out of nothing. Just as all things were created during creation week out of nothing, God created all human souls, all humans out of nothing. And why is this important? Because we're told in Romans 8, 28, and 30, among other places in the Bible, that God predestined humans not out of nothing, but out of something. Namely, what is that something? Foreknowledge. In other words, a pre-predestinational or pre-electional knowledge of each soul that was created. This is discussed in section four of the paper, God's pre-election knowledge of the soul. This is an extremely important, extremely central and basic issue seen in scripture. God created all souls out of nothing, but did not predestine them out of nothing because Calvinists will say the creation of souls and their predestination were the same operation. That is incorrect according to scripture because we very clearly see the creation of souls had to be out of nothing and predestination and election of them was out of something so there's a two-step process creation of souls and their election and predestination is a two-step process one happened before the other so there's a gap of some sort you want to say a gap in time for lack of better words, we just don't know. This is very uh, metaphysical talk. We don't know exactly how God did all this. All we can go by is what we are given in Scripture. So that's why I'm trying to stick to the rudiments of Scripture in developing all of this. Again, I think these are points missed by theologians through time, but simple basic points in Scripture. So anyway, to get to the point, if there is a time or a gap or some period of some sort between the creation of souls and their election, then God would have had knowledge of the souls at that point before they were elected. So God has pre-election knowledge of the soul. That is what foreknowledge is. Knowledge from the first point of the entity's existence. And it is that awareness of the soul God will use to elect and predestine all souls that he has created. Extremely important point, which literally changes much of theology, turns much of theology on its head, and makes a whole lot of theology make tremendous sense. This literally provides an answer to the unanswered question of why God created souls and only chose some to be saved because as is well known in Calvinism humans cannot choose to be saved God can only choose them this is a well-established fact in Christian theology such as in John 1 13 where the NIV says salvation is not based on human decision but on the will of God the choice of God John 15, 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the, your father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. There's verses all over the Bible talking about how God chose humans. Humans did not choose God. If you go look up and Google lists of verses of choosing God or choosing God over Satan and so forth, the list of verses that one gets are all verses about God choosing those who he elected so the idea is that that we can choose god and that we make a choice and we say a prayer and, and invite him into our lives and all that is why we're saved is all false so you've got a couple billion christians on earth that believe a wrong idea now i've discussed this before so i'll be very brief the typical one verse in the bible that's usually used to say that we that we're to choose god for people that go to bother to try to justify it because usually people just say that that's how christianity works we choose god and don't really try to justify it any further than that. People just teach it to kids in Sunday school and so forth, and, and nobody goes to check to see if it's right, which it's not. But it's that first verse listed there in this list here you're seeing from Open Bible. 
dot info and Joshua twenty four fifteen. But that verse doesn't say we choose God. It says that you can choose pagan gods, but as far as the Lord, we will serve Him. Choosing Yahweh, choosing the Father, is never mentioned. It's just said that that's what we do. So still, choice is not applied to anything but pagan gods. So this to understand why God only chose some. We have really three more steps. There's two arguments that go through one after the other, both in section four of this article, God's pre-election knowledge of the soul. The first one goes through these points here, two data points and then a conclusion. Let me just read through. Soul creation happened before election and predestination. Okay, we've already covered that. Point two, predestination was not based on God's knowing the future, but rather determination beforehand for wheat. That's the old English. Based on foreknowledge of a preceding state of the soul before the soul was elected or predestined. This leads to conclusion A in this argument. God knew, foreknew, the pre-election state of the soul at the time of soul creation in order to determine beforehand decisions about electing and predestining. So, in other words, Calvinists typically say a soul will be created to be elected to this purpose. Or a soul, for example, would be created to be condemned, such as Pharaoh. You know, David, for example, was created because God created himself a king, so his soul was created for that purpose. Whereas with Pharaoh, his soul was created to be an antagonist to Moses, and therefore was created to be condemned and destroyed. Now, what we've covered so far shows that that is not correct. What has been covered so far is God created a set of souls, and we'll find out how many shortly. So what we have instead is this picture. God created a set of souls, had knowledge of all of them, and therefore elected and predestined those to be put into reality as needed. Okay, so in other words, instead of specifically creating David's soul, a soul which sinned, as we know, which leads to a mystery. Why would God create his own king, as it says in 1 Samuel 16 and 17, the king he wanted, and then one that sinned. It's mysterious. No, what actually happened is he created that soul, went and found that soul in his set of souls that he created, and knew that that was the soul to be put in that position in the predestinational reality that God created. So he needed a soul to fit in that slot of King David, for example. He looked in all the possible souls that he created and found the one that was the match and placed it in reality. That's what you are, a soul and a specific match to go into your slot in the reality that God created. Now you might want to rewind that and meditate on that a little bit, but this is what scripture seems to lead to. If you just take some of these fine points, some of these fine detailed verses, such as Romans 8, 28, 29, and other ones that are discussed all throughout that God's pre election knowledge of the soul paper I wrote. And this is kind of where you get to. It's just so a small difference of saying instead of God creating a soul to be predestined, no, God created all souls and then went and looked at them all and found the ones to go in specific places in reality. That specific difference between those two ideas is tremendous in how it changes theology in, in just tiny improvements on interpreting scripture lead to that small yet tremendous and huge difference in theology. Now, before we get to argument B, which will show us why God only chose some, we have to reanalyze verses such as Ecclesiastes 11.5, Revelation 4.11, Colossians 1.16 and 17, which are verses that say God created all things. Now we know we didn't create sin because sin is not a thing. It is a non. Th it is a no thing, a nothing, which is I've discussed elsewhere and is well discussed by Calvinist theologians since Augustine. But let's get to the point. We need to have a different interpretation of those passages of God being the creator of all things than we've had to this point. For some reason, through time, people have interpreted verses like Colossians one sixteen: "For by him all things were created." In the NIV, for example, would say, in him all things are created. There's a difference between by him and in, in him. That's not the point right now. The point is, is that the indwelling Logos, the divine Logos, Christ, is the creator of all. Now, what does that word all mean? 
as I discussed in section four of this paper, does all mean everything that happens to exist? Or does all mean all that can exist? In other words, let me put this in this more simple to understand way. Is God being the creator of all things, meaning that God created everything that could possibly exist. So if there can be infinite worlds, he created all infinite worlds. And by that, God created everything that possibly could exist. Everything that can exist was created. Now, typically, from what I can tell, people do not interpret verses like these, like Colossians 1, 16, 17, in this way. And they don't consider that everything that can exist does exist. Everything that can be created was in fact created. No, they seem to interpret it as a more finite view. Whatever happens to exist, yes, indeed, God created. But it's never entertained that God created all possible things. No, he just created some stuff. Could have been more. Could have been less, but he created what he did. A very finite view rather than a fullness. Everything that possibly could be created was created. More succinctly put, this second view involves the idea that whatever does happen to exist, God created. And the idea that it's all possible things that could have been created is not brought up. That view cannot be correct. It brings God's creation into sort of the way we see things in a finite way. No, God's infinite. It says in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, the two realities have some mimicry of each other. In other words, the reality down here, the whole earth cries out for the Lord. All the creatures cry out for the Lord, it says in Romans 8. The whole earth is filled with his glory, Isaiah says. There is some resemblance on earth as it is in heaven if that's true which we see from scripture then the infinity of god would be a more accurate way to interpret our reality down here on earth this reality is somehow more like an infinite reality than the finite one we we humans interpret or misinterpret. So it's better to say God created all things means God created all possible things since God is a fullness. Then the reality he created should be better interpreted as a fullness rather than a finitude. Okay, so I interpret... A verse like Revelation 4.11 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. <laughs> that tells us why we exist right there. Because God wanted fellowship. He wanted love for his pleasure. So anyways... God created all things that could possibly exist. That's a tremendous change in theology. Why has anybody interpreted this to mean that God created all things, meaning a finite collection or that a minimal collection or some kind of collection that's in accord with what our little human minds think exists? When God is infinite, Psalm 147.5 in the KJV, great is our God, Lord, and of great power, his understanding is infinite. That's a fullness of understanding. So reality should be a fullness, physical reality. There could be infinite cosmoi. That's the plural for, cos, for un, cosmoses, multiple cosmos. There probably is. There are probably infinite souls. Or if not, the maximum number there could possibly be, if they're discrete indifference rather than continuous indifference where there only could be finite numbers of souls but a huge number say googleplex times googleplex souls that's what god's going to create if that's how many there can be 
all possible shapes of snowflakes, all possible shapes of leaves, all possible shapes of clouds, trees, all possible shapes and structures and textures of souls of humans will be created. God created all things. God created everything. He created any, everything that could exist. Now that leads to another argument, which specifically tells us why God chose some, not all. Call this argument B. It leads to conclusion B. It's the second argument. Let's go through it here. Step one, God created an undirected set of souls, which may have been all souls that could possibly be created. Okay, so undirected means he didn't say, I'm going to create this type of soul. I need one that is David and one that's Pharaoh. So I'm going to create those two. And then all different kinds that could have been created, all different structures and textures of different human souls, I'm not going to create. I'm just going to create these specific ones. No, if God created all things, he created, an un he created every soul that could possibly exist without looking at creating specific ones, a finite number. No, he created all of them. And then find out, and then looked at the structure and texture of each one in order to find out what to do with them, where to put them in reality. This one I can put my spirit into. It's a very powerful soul, much like mine. It's David. I'm going to put it in David's slot in reality, David's position. This one cannot be saved. And it is a soul that no matter how much of my works it sees, it will never believe. It'll only have a hard heart. I'm going to put that one in Pharaoh's body, in Pharaoh's slot. As he sees the collection of souls before he elects them, he sees what they're like. He knows what to do with them. This is a much more sensible, biblically structured, scriptural interpretation of predestination. And really makes a lot of sense out of, I think, where Calvinism and Calvinists have been trying to go. Because it's been stated, you know, God created a bunch of souls and chose these and not those. And pe that's turned people away from Christ. That doesn't make any sense. That's not fair. How can that possibly be? Well, right. That's a good question. I see Sproul, I quote him in the conclusion of this paper, section 5. He says, I don't know. He's the... One of the most famous Calvinists in the world was. He just he died not too long ago, a couple years ago. His answer to that is, I don't know why God chose all these souls and not those. Well, this, what I call fullness Calvinism, God creating the fullness of souls, all the souls that could possibly exist, shows exactly why. Because some souls he can put his spirit into, and some he can't. If he's going to create all of them, he's going to, there's going to be at least two different types. There's going to be a type that he deems he can put his spirit into because it's similar enough to him to varying levels. And there'll be another type where he will deem he cannot put his spirit into because it is not similar enough to him. And there'll be a spectrum there. Just barely not similar to diametrically opposite of God. So going through argument B here, God created an undirected set of souls, which may have been all souls that possibly could be created. Point number two, conclusion A above, which we know is the conclusion that God foreknew the prelection state of every soul in order to determine what to do with them. Then data point number three, not all souls seen by God in the pre-election step before they were elected and predetermined were determined and settled as being salvific. That is those souls that can be seen to be the, of the quality of being capable of receiving faith and having his word and spirit implanted into them. That leads to conclusion B. Only some souls can be chosen since not every soul is capable of being indwelt. So if God creates an infinity of souls or maximum possible souls that can be created, there's going to be at least two types. Those that are similar enough to him that he can place his spirit into and those which are not. The latter are unchosen and will be placed in areas of reality where the condemned, the unsaved, the non-salvific 
need to be placed, such as in Pharaoh's body. And there you have it, right out of scripture. It's very simple. That's why God only chose some. It appears theologians have just missed these points. That's why what I call fullness Calvinism here clearly explains it. And we can see here the well-known scriptural fact of why people can't choose God. God only can choose people. Because this, it's already determined, the structure of their soul determines why they're placed in reality where they are. If they can be appointed to be believers or not, as it says in Acts 13, 48. So this shows then why there are so many people that God kills or are killed by God's people. Or in the Old Testament, for example. A lot of people are very troubled by that. How can there be all this murder while many souls can be put in positions in reality where they can function as sort of throwaway items? If reality requires people to be in positions where they need to be terminated, those souls that are unsaved can be placed into those bodies. But let's get to a more basic description of why the world is how it is and what fullness Calvinism says about it. Why is the world so dark? Why is there sin that has scarred the world to lead to so much pain and misery? Why are there sinful creatures and therefore a world as dark as we live in now? Fullness Calvinism answers this completely. And I don't think other theologies really do, from what I can tell. And the first point I want to go over, and that is, God created all souls that can exist. Sinful souls brought sin into creation. When original sin happened, all human souls, somehow or another, had, were sinful, had sin. And that leads to another point, when the sinful humans were placed into reality, we know that Adam sinned, and this sin scarred reality, including all of human souls, giving them original sin, creating a reality of pain and misery, including a place called hell, which I've discussed in great length in another article. And that leads to a great question. Why did God put those souls into creation? Why did he just put only the souls that wouldn't have been capable of sin? Because in the spectrum of all souls, there's going to be a set of those. And all possible souls. There's going to be some that, if you put them in reality, they won't sin. Instead, he put the first two we, we, uh, that we have specific account of in the Bible, Adam and Eve, sinned, and therefore led to all souls then having original sin. At least in our reality. Our set of souls and our this cosmos all were contaminated with this original sin. You know, why did God do it that way? This essentially boils down to the question of why did God create a reality that instead of staying like Eden forever is this reality of pain and misery? Because essentially God chose for this one to exist, not the pre-sin Eden reality. So when we know that God will put all the souls into reality, it's not like he's going to leave some of the souls out and just those who wouldn't, that wouldn't create sin like Adam, you know, keep them out and keep all the souls that'll be sinless and put them in. So he's got an Eden pre-sin, even Eden forever. We know that's not what God's going to do because we already covered that. Because God is a fullness and his creation has fullness. He creates everything that can be. So for that reason, just like his collection of souls for their elected and predestined is a set of all possible souls, the creation also has to be a set of all possible souls. You can't have the collection of souls being maximum in number. 
but then creation not resembling God and having the maximal state. All possible souls that can, can exist. Probably infinite. So we know that all the souls will be put in. That's why you've got a reality that we have. Where sin scarred it. Because God only will, will create what's going to be like him. He's not an infinite God that's going to create some finite little thing. He's an infinite God that's going to create infinities. Whatever that means. We don't know exactly what that means. And there's going to be more sides to this as well. It's not like that's the only reason God put all the souls in reality. And therefore we have reality where sin entered and therefore scarred creation as it entered through human free will and minds. We also know in the word it tells us that God's job is he wants to be merciful. So it does make sense to have a reality with sin so God can do his part to give grace. That's what really just floors us and drops us to our, our knees about God. Because we see his power is so different from the, the world of sin. So it all that's another piece of the puzzle that fits into this. Of why the sinful souls were put into slots in reality as well. And then I'm sure there's other reasons too that we could state as well. So we know point three here. Reality was created with fullness. So all souls, even unchosen ones, were planted into creation. And this is why reality is as it is. With all the darkness and misery and so forth. Point three just given shows why reality was created as it was, where sin and darkness scar it. When I say darkness, I mean generally fallenness, uh, where animals eat each other instead of eating vegetation, where there's pain and misery and confusion all over, where even the animals cry out wanting to have their union again with the Father, as it says in Romans 8. That's darkness. That's what I mean by this general term, darkness. But this very clearly shows why reality is as it is. Now, this leads to a very, very important, the most important point of all. And that point is, is that we, we don't have to live by the darkness and misery and sin. We can live by pure explosive joy of the Trinity of God now. We can escape all this now. That is most accurately described in my document on belief uh, prayer, which is titled The Inner Mysticism of Simple Perpetual Verb-like Belief in Christ, subtitled Luke 850 and Intensity in the Presence of God. That leads to this point five here, we do not have to live in this reality. We can enter and start salvation with Christ now, wherein the darkness and misery of creation is fully eclipsed by the sheer joy of the Trinity. This is the whole point, the whole purpose of our lives here in reality. To escape the world. To be citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.20 To claim our salvation. To partake in salvation now. Psalm 13, 5, NIV. So again, this is an initial sketch of fullness Calvinism, which, as you can see, purports to explain why there is sin, why there is pain, why there is misery, why God created this world, why the perfect loving God created a world with sin, darkness, hatred, pain, misery, Satan, and so forth. Why it is very likely that there are many universes, many cosmoi, perhaps infinite, infinite souls, why only some of those were chosen, and so forth. Thanks for listening.